come to our regular VUP students of this course, but also, of course, to all of you who have decided to tune in from outside and are eager to learn about EU-Japan relations, which is the topic of today's lecture. Uh, this lecture is part of the third and last module of our course on Japan's foreign and security policy, which is proposed by the Japan program at the VUB, in which we decided to zoom out a little bit from Asia, from uh, the Indo-Pacific region, uh, and examine the role of Japan as a global security actor and political actor. Now, the story of EU-Japan rapprochement is, uh, is a fascinating one in, in many ways. Uh, for, for one, it exemplifies the, I would say, evolving uh, political and security profiles of both actors. Um, it uh, shows well the, the, the sort of shifting perceptions that both uh, have vis-a-vis -vis each other's and of each other's uh, possible usefulness in, in today's uh, evolving and, and turbulent uh, strategic environment um, and uh, of the changing needs uh, that we may have uh, in the Indo-Pacific and expectations uh, in the Indo-Pacific and, and, and globally. Now, enough from me. I'm absolutely uh, delighted to uh, have the expert, actually, two experts on the topic. Uh, our main speaker is Professor Yuichi Hosoya, professor from the Keio University, uh, but uh, Professor Hosoya holds also many other uh, think tank positions and used to hold many governmental positions as well. He's uh, one of the uh, long-standing observers uh, of EU-Japan relations and international relations uh, altogether. Professor Hosea, it's a pleasure to, to have you here. We will listen to Professor for about 45 minutes or slightly, slightly less if um, we will see how that goes. And after that, I will pass the floor uh, to Professor uh, Michael Reiterer, who is uh, now uh, joined uh, the Center for Security and Diplomacy and Strategy at the VUB, but Professor Reiter is a, is a career diplomat with, uh, with an outstanding um, experience at the, uh, in the European External Action Service in Asia and in Brussels and is intimately um, familiar with, with the process from, from inside. I hope we will have time for uh, the Q&A afterwards. You can already start, uh, you know, thinking and, and posting your questions uh, in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And of course, uh, just a reminder, all this lecture is recorded, so you can always share and listen to it again anytime you want. Now, uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Hosoya, <laughs> The floor is yours, and uh, we're very much looking forward to your lecture. Well, thank you very much indeed, Eva, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, great uh, public lecture series. Uh, many of my friends actually previously talked at this public seminar, and uh, it's really gorgeous. And this time as well, of course, Eva herself is one of the best leading experts on the EU-Japan relations or EU's Asian policy. And also, I also like to add that the Professor Michael Reiter is also one of the best experts on the field. Actually, I invited him to Keio University, my university, several times uh, uh, as a visitor, vi visiting uh, professor or uh, a, a, a speaker at the symposium, international symposium at the Keio University, because he was once uh, 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 EU's uh, minister to Japan before he undertook the post of EU's ambassador to Korea, Republic of Korea. So uh, if something happened with me, uh, he can easily uh, uh, actually replace my role as a main speaker, but uh, I'm also looking forward to his response and his comments on my talk. Uh, sometimes I will talk something quite provocative and some of the problems of the EU-Japan relations. And of course, uh, I myself feel that Japan is important for the European Union, but uh, of course, uh, I also need to talk about Asia or Indo-Pacific or China, because now US-China relation is at the center of international politics. And also uh, Indo-Pacific region is currently uh, the main theater 
of international relations. So everybody who are interested in international politics need to understand more deeply about what's happening in the region, I mean, the, in the Pacific region. So today I like to uh, use my PowerPoint slide to, to uh, clarify my talk. Sometimes my pronunciation might not be quite too clear. So that's why I like to rely on my PowerPoint slide. And I think that you can uh, see my PowerPoint slides. In the, I move to the oh, next page. This is a basic outline of today's lecture. I uh, focus on the three point. First, uh, today in a structural confrontation between liberal democracies and authoritarian regimes, or between United States and China, Japan occupies a vital place in EU's Asian strategy. Uh, not only for uh, the European Union, but also for the United States as well, because uh, uh, Japanese Prime Minister Suga was American first, uh, Biden's first uh, 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 counterpart in his summit meeting in person. Uh, Prime Minister Suga actually visited Washington DC last month to meet with uh, new president uh, Joe Biden. Uh, Joe Biden wanted to host uh, Prime Minister Suga because to effectively implement current American in the Pacific strategy, Japan occupied the most important place without using American bases in uh, Japan, without uh, having a very strong support from Japan, it is totally impossible for the United States to uh, influence American power in the region, particularly on the Taiwan issues. I know that uh, many people nowadays are very much interested in further a war will happen between China and the Taiwan. But uh, uh, to prevent that, of course, Japan, Taiwan, and the United States must increase its deterrence towards China to refrain China from uh, uh, doing something quite uh, adventurous or provocative in the region. But anyway, now we have to put many important issues in a much uh, a, a bigger framework of a conf structural confrontation between liberal democracies and authoritarian regimes. Of course, as you naturally understand very well, uh, the European Union is the core of liberal democracies. European Union strongly embraces the norm of democracy, human rights, rule of law, and so on. So without EU the strong support, I'm not quite sure whether we can continue to see uh, the uh, strong uh, liberal international order. As well, of course, in the Indo-Pacific region, Japan has been the most or one of the most important powers which actually support liberal international order. In that sense, I think that it is also very important for the EU to think about Japan as important the strategic partner. And then on the other hand, in the last three decades, I need to say that the China rather than Japan has been the core of EU's Asian strategy, reflecting its expanding economic size. Uh, when we think about the side of Chinese economy and also the speed of China's uh, economic growth, uh, we have to uh, realize that China has been always the center of radar screen for the European Union's Asian policy or Asian strategy. Of course, it remained basically the same, but we have seen several different uh, uh, factors or several different recent movements. First of all, this month, just a week before, a Chinese media covered that I think that for the first time, uh, now China enter into the shrinking population for the first time. The, the most recent uh, statistics shows that China records the decrease in its population. Of course, it still is the largest population in the world, China is. But uh, on the other hand, we have to also think about China's one-child policy, 
And because of the China's one child policy, I would say that China will enter into really, really rapid uh, shrinking population. And the speed will be much faster than before. And uh, the, 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 the start of the shrinking actually comes uh, earlier, several years earlier than uh, uh, the US government originally estimated. So this naturally means that uh, China has to face a uh, 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 population bonus, not the population bonus. It means that China will suffer severely from the, uh, 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 the shrinking of the working population. Uh, uh, so uh, it, uh, of course, naturally uh, links to China's huge investment in uh, AI, AI, artificial in intelligence, and also many, many digitalization because China uh, can now rely on these technologies, cutting edge technology. So I'm not saying that China is weakening. China is still powerful and China will become more powerful perhaps after the COVID-19. So we have to continue to look at the direction of China's politics or Chinese foreign policy. But uh, well, uh, at the same time, I also like to say that after joining for many European countries, after joining in the AIIB, uh, many European governments, including the European Union itself, uh, now are disillusioned by the opportunity that the China provides. Uh, these European powers originally thought that they could gain much bigger interest by benefits out of joining in the AIB, but the result is not so. They now feel that they cannot gain such a huge benefits by joining in some of the Chinese projects such as BRR and so on. So uh, in this sense as well, uh, now uh, European powers and the uh, European Union are thinking that uh, much more than they originally expected. Uh, Japan uh, occupies a very important place for use agent strategy. And thirdly, I also like to talk that uh, EU has so far expanded its presence in the Indo-Pacific region in the recent years in cooperation with Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. In this context, Japan is regarded as a normative power which shares important norms such as democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, among others. And I think that many of you might be familiar with the recent news coverage about human rights violations in the uh, Xinjiang area. Uh, in the area, uh, uh, many uh, Uyghurs are, are, are suffering from uh, China's quite oppressive regime. Of course, Chinese government, the Communist Party has been repeatedly denying, rejecting that accusation. But uh, uh, it might be uh, 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 worth remembering that, recalling that uh, for many decades, not recent years, uh, China's policy in the area is quite different from Russia's policy in the area. Uh, Russia has, actually allowed much wider uh, 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 self-government, self-governing uh, in the area. Uh, on the other hand, China likes to have historically much stronger control by Beijing, central government. So uh, it would be natural to esti uh, estimate, to assume that uh, China try to control and try to pressure uh, those people in the area who are against the stronger China's control. With digital technologies, China, Chinese government or communist party can much more effectively control the people in the area, like a digital money, digital currency, and they can control their spending as well. Uh, so in the sense, because of these human rights violations or the accusations on this point by uh, Western democracies. And nowadays, uh, the EU has understood that EU, 
EU has a much larger role to play in the area as well, to try to consolidate important norms, which the European Union has been enhancing within the European Union, not just within the European Union, not just with neighboring countries. I think that the European Union is not now much more willing to uh, play an important role in consolidating those important norms. So uh, uh, to sum up, I like to uh, emphasize the importance of Japan in uh, EU's agent strategy, unlike before. Before that, I need to mention that uh, uh, in the uh, last three decades, uh, the EU-Japan relations has not been uh, evolved powerfully, unlike we originally expected. The year 2021, I mean, this year marks the 30th anniversary of the Hague Declaration of 1991 between Japan and the European community. The name was the European community at that time. And uh, with this, we can divide these three decades into uh, three parts. The first phase of these 30 years of the EU-Japan cooperation is uh, 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 actually a uh, is uh, characterized as a lack of Japanese enthusiasm for Europe. At that time, Japanese government was, a ja or Japanese people or Japanese business companies were much more interested in Asia. They had rapidly expanding uh, their investments and their trade and their communication with Asian countries. So many Japanese business companies actually went to these Asian countries like Taiwan, Korea, China, of course, the African countries. On the other hand, they basically didn't think a lot about the possibility and opportunities in the European Union. So that's why we saw clear lack of Japanese enthusiasm for Europe or for the European integration. Also in the decade, uh, Japanese economy began to decline. So that's why on the other hand, the European Union as well had lost their strong interest in Japanese economy. So it means that in this decade, the European Union changed its uh, a direction of interest from Japan to China. So this meant the beginning of stronger EU-China relations. And then in the second decade between 2001 and 2011, we saw clear and surprising growth of Chinese economy and also Chinese political presence in the world. In this decade, including Japan itself, uh, international community was extremely optimistic about the future of China. Even Japanese people didn't really think about the fact that China will become future Japanese number one threat, military threat. Because in 2001, China's military spending budget is just a one, one fifth of Japanese defense spending. So around that time, if China doesn't use its nuclear weapons, Many people within Japan's self-defense forces thought that the self-defense forces, Japan's self-defense forces, without the support, even without the support of US forces, they thought that they can defeat Chinese people revelations on. So uh, around the period, uh, Japanese people did not really need to think about China as a military threat. But on the other hand, when the world international community was looking at terrorism or the war on terror or the Bush administration policy towards the Middle East, international community during this period didn't really look at the speed of Chinese military build up. And China was overturning 
the status quo in the South China Sea. China control, began to control nearly all the islands in the South China Sea. So now South China Sea is Chinese lake. Uh, because uh, ASEAN member states didn't have a sufficient amount of military power. So it was not difficult for China to change the status quo by force. It was also interesting to remind that 2002, in 2002, China agreed with the ASEAN on the uh, doctrine of conduct. The agreement between the ASEAN and China uh, means that the both sides refrain from using military power to change the status quo, particularly on the territorial issues. They agree to respect international law. They agree to uh, rely on peaceful resolution of conflict. So ASEAN particularly was quite optimistic about China's foreign policy. Hu Jintao's administration is different from Xi Jinping's current administration. They had some good reason to be optimistic about their cooperation with China. But having said that, people, People's Liberation Army remains the same. People's Liberation Army did their job to change the status quo in the South China Sea by using the threat of the use of military force. On the other hand, as I said, Japan was also quite optimistic about future regional cooperation. That's why in 2002, January 2002, Japanese Prime Minister at that time, Junichiro Koizumi, proposed to create East Asian community with China. Of course, China, Japan, Korea had to be the core of such East Asian community, even though he also mentioned that Japan respected uh, ASEAN centrality. ASEAN centrality means that any kind of regional integration in East Asia must be and uh, must have the ASEAN at the core. ASEAN, ASEAN must always be the center of East Asian integration or cooperation or regionalism. That's why we call it as ASEAN centrality. But anyway, in the second decade, of 30 years of Japan-EU political cooperation. In the second decade, we have to notice that Jap including Japan international community was focusing on uh, quite a constructive China's role in international community. And Japan relies on that. And Japan began to East Asian, and Japan actually initiated the process of East Asian community building. And 2005 in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, uh, we began the first East Asian summit meeting. And uh, this was initiated by Japan, Korea, Singapore, some other countries. Uh, anyway, around that time, even Japanese government strongly believed in and strongly engaged in East Asian uh, regional cooperation or regional community building with China. And then come the third decade. Third decade is characterized by the rapid growth of China, not just the growth of Chinese power, but the, the growth of Chinese uh, threat in the region or to the international community. And also the revival of interest in the closer EU-Japan relationship. And also the conclusion of the EPA, SPA as well. In the third decade, we have seen a different kind of China, a different kind of China because of several reasons. One reason is that in 2008 and 2009, we experienced a serious financial crisis, which began in the United States and spread in the European Union and in Asia as well, but not quite in China because China actually initiated a huge stimulus plan package of economic growth policy. So around this time, we thought that against the current of economic uh, growth decline in leading democracies, we saw that China's powerful dynamic economic growth. And we uh, assume that China would do, be uh, replacing American role as global leader, particularly in the field of uh, global economy. 
So um, in the third phase, in the third phase of the thirty years, these thirty years, uh, particularly our attitude towards China has been transformed quite significantly. And in the beginning, Japan changed its attitudes because in two thousand ten, uh, China became the second biggest economy after only after the United States or economic power, economic country. Uh, of course, excluding the European Union, European Union is bigger than the United States or China. But uh, if we look at nations, uh, uh, China became the second largest economy uh, in the world. But after a decade, around that time, uh, China's economy equal to Japan's economy. The size was the size was nearly the same because uh, Japan was replaced by China as the number two economy in the world to next just next to the United States. But uh, after a decade, since 2010, when uh, uh, China replaced Japan's position, after a decade. We now experience that uh, China's economy is now uh, two or three times bigger than Japanese economy, around the three times bigger than Japanese economy. So uh, you can easily understand how fast Chinese economic growth has been in the decade after <clears throat> 2010. So uh, China, uh, due to these factors, unexpectedly uh, becomes uh, incredibly arrogant in some aspects. If you read People's Daily, a China's semi-official newspapers, you can see many articles which look down on both the European Union and the United States. They are feeling, I mean, the Chinese people are now feeling that they are surpassing both the European Union and the United States. And they are now feeling that their civilization their culture, their political regime are superior to American democracy or European Union institutions. So they are much less willing, and now really angry about hearing the criticisms coming from the United States and the European Union on human rights issues, because they now feel that their political regime, political culture, civilizations are superior to uh, these other regions, I mean, the United States and the European Union. So that's why they feel no reason. They think that they have no reason to listen to these criticisms. But not just uh, they are criticizing both the Un European Union and the United States, they are looking down on these two paths, I mean, the European Union and the United States, because they simply feel that they are superior to these. Of course, they think that they are superior to Japan as well. That's why it is nowadays very difficult to have an equal conversation, conversation on the footing of the equal status. It is now extremely difficult to have such equal relationship with China or uh, to have a strategic partnership with China. But we have, I mean, the Japan have or Japan has had uh, more than 1,500 years history of the difficult relationship with China. Japan was never colonized by China. Unlike many surrounding countries, uh, it's always important for Japan to take a proper distance from China. Uh, there are reasons. One of the biggest reasons is that it's really difficult for us, Japan, to uh, create an equal uh, a partnership or equal cooperation, equal uh, footing cooperation with China. China uh, uh, would either dominate Japan nor exclude Japan from its civilization. So outer Chinese civilization, uh, inf inferior uh, civilization exists. So we are, I mean, Japan has been quite barbarian to China because we, uh, Japan uh, has been out of Chinese civilization. So there is no superior civilization out of Chinese civilization. So this is uh, the case for China's 
attitude towards the United States and China's attitude towards the European Union has been. So it's really, really uh, important and uh, important to notice that the both European Union and uh, according to Chinese government or Chinese people, European Union or the United States has not entitled to criticize Chinese political regime or China's human rights violation. So uh, China becomes much more arrogant, much more powerful, and much more self-confident. So we need to have a different approach to China than before. But it seems, but both, it seems that both the United States and the European Union maintain the similar kind of approach to China under the current circumstance. And then I look back, uh, like to look back on the Hague Declaration on the Japan ECEU relations. On 18th July 1991, Japanese Prime Minister Toshiki Kaifu visited the Hague and had a summit meeting with Jack Delors, the president of the European Union Commission and the Lubels of the Netherlands, the president at the time of the European Council. And they signed the joint declaration between Japan and the European community. And this becomes the first important document between Japan and the European Union. In the document, Japan and the Ishii declare that they were conscious of their common attachment to freedom, democracy, the rule of law, and human rights. Japan is thus regarded as EU's normal partner. It is important to remind that from the beginning, uh, the European community or European Union regards Japan as a normative partner, it share, which share uh, important norms. Because the uh, European community, European Union is basically a quite normative community or normative union. Without these norms, I would say that the European community, European Union cannot exist. It's not just a free trade area. The UK uh, want to maintain that broke just as a free trade area, a little bit, little bit more than that. Not the political entity, but it is political entity with clear important norms such as freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. So uh, they naturally uh, think that Japan can become an important partner, which share important values. And then uh, it is uh, written uh, in uh, European uh, Communities Commission paper uh, entitled Toward a New Asian Strategy. Japan's presence in East Asia and the role that it has played in that region's development is massive and ongoing. Japan is gradually assuming a high uh, profile throughout Asia. Although, and then uh, it uh, was uh, uh, summed up, uh, it uh, was summed up that although ECU relations, Japan relations, have been characterized by trade conflicts. The linkage between the two has been the strongest and all bilateral relations between the ECU and East Asia. Around that time, as I mentioned before, Asia was regarded as a new frontier. Asian economic growth was really dynamic and Europe also wanted to engage more deeply in Asia, but uh, they, actually didn't know where to go. So they first uh, tried to create a stronger partnership with Japan to strengthen EU's presence in Asia. Uh, so this is, Japan was a kind of a tool to, uh, uh, to uh, expand the EU's presence and the EU's interest in Asia. That's why they expected that Japan can play an important role to help the European community or European Union to engage more in the region. But actually Japan cannot play such important role. So in 1995, in the document, European, European, European Union and uh, Japan uh, entitled The Next Step, uh, it is written that the EU and Japan are industrialized democracies facing the challenges of world economic interdependence. We share a key interest in a stable multilateral economic system and in the maintenance of global security. Both are developing new approaches to foreign and security policy in which the links with the US will remain strong but not omnipresent. Each is striving for constructive relationship with Russia and China and with different parts of Asia." Unquote. So around that time, 
many people in Europe thought that uh, Japan and the EU share many, many common values. They both thought that the United States had been uh, reducing its military presence in the world uh, soon after the end of the Cold War. And also, uh, they thought that the United States was extremely unilateralist in its foreign policy. That's why the EU and Japan must support and enhance multilateralism in international cooperation. So uh, they began to enhance such partnership, but uh, against its original expectation, Japan couldn't play a sufficient role which uh, the United European Union originally wanted to see. So then they changed their attitude and uh, shifted their interest from Japan to, uh, to China. And then they uh, changed the world from Japan to Asia. Uh, the European Union began to create its Asian strategy. Having seen the rise of the Asia Pacific regionalism with uh, the enhancement of the APEC, Asia Pacific uh, Economic Cooperation or summit meeting of that, the EU needed to do something to increase its presence in East Asia because they thought that they would miss the bus. They couldn't ride on the bus. And without riding the bus of Asian economic growth, the European Union around that time thought that they could not enjoy uh, economic benefits out of engaging more deeply in Asia. Then the EU began to recognize the necessity of having a single coherent strategy towards Asia. On 13 July 1994, the first Asian strategy paper was submitted to the European Council. And the title is Towards a New Asia Strategy. It was written, quote, the rise of Asia is dramatically changing the world balance of economic power, unquote. Therefore, the European Union needs as a matter of urgency to strengthen its economic presence in Asia in order to maintain its leading role in the world economy, unquote. They thought that the European Union must be at the center of the global economy. For the purpose, the EU also need to expand its influence and its presence in Asia as well. So this is the timeline of EU-Asia relations. And then EU began to have, after seeing the war on terror, EU began to create its global strategy to tackle with difficulties in the world. And they began to uh, create a much stronger cooperation, political and security cooperation with Japan. And like in Europe, uh, power politics and the expansion of military spending remain important factor in Asian international politics. So that's why EU's integrated approach to conflict and crisis show its limits in dealing with problems in Asia, such as North Korean nuclear and the missile crises and territorial conflicts in the South China Sea. <coughs> it was regarded in EU's security strategy of 2003 that EU has its distinctive strategic or security culture. So you can rely on soft power and you can rely on uh, a, a, a confidence building, but they didn't basically think that it needed a stronger military, uh, military power to tackle with international security problems. But the slowly they changed, began to change the attitude because the EU also need to have a military muscles. So EU began to think that EU can enhance its security partnerships in the region, particularly with Japan, which shares core values and norms. Its influence will be multiplied as written in the EU's global strategy paper in 2016. EU global strategy paper of 2016, focusing on the importance of security partnership with, with Asian countries. Of course, EU cannot itself rapidly increase its defense spending. On the other hand, by enhancing its security partnership with countries of uh, leading powers in Asia, they began to think that they can increase its influence in the region. And also to maintain and enhance the rule-based international order in Asia, the EU can play a leading role. 
yield security identity differs from traditional global military powers such as the United States and China. EU's soft power is larger than these two global powers in the region. Of course, as I mentioned before, soft power itself cannot solve the difficult issues such as problems in North Korea, you know, North Korea nuclear problem, problems, or maritime security issues in the South China Sea. But then I just touch upon the Asia uh, part within the EU's global strategy of 2016. It is written, quote, that a connected Asia, there is a direct connection between European prosperity and Asian security in light of the economic weight that Asia represents for the EU and the vice versa, peace and the stability in Asia are a prerequisite for our prosperity. We will deepen economic diplomacy and scale up our security role in Asia, unquote. At that time, I think that the European Union was struggling, struggling to try to find its role in Asia of course, there are not so many things that the uh, European Union uh, uh, could do quite effectively in the region to solve security problems, but uh, you needed to do something. That's why you, uh, in this document, it was written that you has a clear role in the region, even though the reality is much more complex. I think that uh, at later stage, uh, 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 Michael, as a discussant, can follow up these kind of issues because I suppose that he has been deeply uh, involved with and engaged in these kind of issues within the European Union. So that's why also as a professor in some universities, I think that he can talk more about these kind of important issues, how the European Union was struggling to increase in the influence in the region, I mean, the Asia. And also in Japan, well, uh, in, in EU global strategy paper, EU, uh, Japan is written in a distinctive uh, a, 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 a paragraph. It was written, quote, in parallel, the EU will deepen its economic diplomacy in the region working towards ambitious free trade agreements with the strategic partners such as Japan and India. We will also develop a more politically rounded approach to Asia, seeking to make greater practical contributions to Asian security. We will expand our partnerships, including on security with Japan, the Republic of Korea, Indonesia, and others." Unquote. So this is not new. I mean, the European Union is now expanding its influence in the Pacific, in the Pacific region, but it's not quite new. In the last one or two decades, the European Union has been trying to find out some way to increase its influence in the region, particularly in security field as well. And then these are EU's partners in Asia, but particularly it is significant that uh, uh, Japan has created not just strategic partnership, but the EPA, SPA as well. I will talk a little bit uh, uh, more about this later, even though I have a few minutes to end. So this is a phase of uh, the negotiation between Japan and the EU on SPA. SPA is Strategic Partnership Agreement. It's a document, so it's a documented partnership. So it's much stronger than the other EU strategic partnerships, I would say. And uh, not just that, EU concluded the uh, EPA, uh, economic partnership agreement. It's a much more comprehensive uh, free trade area agreement. So with this, I would say that the European Union and the Japan are cooperating in creating the standard of uh, norms and rules in global trade. Japan EU EPA is now the biggest free trade area in the world. And uh, of course, our city is huge as well, but uh, 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 on the bigger as well. But uh, actually, uh, Japan EU EPA has a special role to play. I mean that uh, this should create the standard or foundation of global uh, uh, trade norms and rules. 
And then I have to uh, end with my talk by uh, mentioning a little bit about China. As I talked in the beginning of my lecture today, uh, now Japan and Europe are engaging in an ideological battle with China. Japan has been advocating an inclusive and open regional order in the Indo-Pacific. On the contrary, some countries such as Malaysia and China favored much more exclusive Asian regional order in a civilizational or racial term based on its Asian, Asianist ideology. A president Xi Jinping in May 2014 tried to exclude external powers from Asian security order at the Shika summit by proposing Asian security by the Asians. It's interesting that Japan said similar things before the Second World War. Japan wanted to create exclusive Asianist regional order. Now China is trying to create such order by excluding both the European Union and the uh, European United States as well. Uh, not just that, China is trying to exclude Australia, New Zealand, and some other parts uh, from Asian security order because they call these are white countries or white powers. So the, the assumption is basically racist. I mean, racist mean that because they are white, they are not Asians. That's of course, there are many white Asians. So that's why uh, we need to have much more open regional order, including United States, EU, Australia, of course, New Zealand, and so on, and Canada as well. So Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific vision is different from China's vision of much more exclusive Asian security order. Chinese economic order is much more inclusive and open uh, to some extent. But on the other hand, on the other hand, they, when they think about the security order, they basically tend to become much more exclusive in creating it. So. Uh, in the sense uh, I talked already uh, about that before, uh, Japan and the EU are in a very difficult place, diff difficult place because uh, positions, because now uh, they are defensive. They are defensive in a sense that liberal democracy uh, is criticized by authoritarian regimes. Uh, liberal democracy is a very weak in providing vaccinations or to uh, defend from these uh, spread of pandemic. And also they argue that authoritarian regimes are much more stronger in reviving their own economy after these kind of pandemic. So we have to show that liberal democracies are strong enough to revitalize economies and uh, by trying to stop uh, uh, or refrain the, the, the spread of these a coronavirus on any kind of pandemic. So EU recently began to use the term systemic rival to characterize China in its relationship to the EU. So both EU and Japan understand the importance of the economic relationship with China while responding more effectively to China's challenge to the current liberal international order. So uh, we have to think further, we can defend uh, liberal international order or not. And we have to ask whether we can defend our liberal democratic regimes and uh, we, whether we can have many advantages uh, in our liberal democratic regime against these authoritarian regimes. So uh, we have many tasks to do to uh, fulfill these tasks. I think that we need to collaborate more. So this is the point where we have traveled from the Hague uh, Declaration of 1991 and after the three decades, we are now reaching at this stage, but still we have so many tasks, so more tasks to, to overcome at this current point. Thank you very much for hearing my talk. yuichi san um, it is me who has to thank you. Uh, this was uh, extremely thorough, comprehensive, You've covered a large ground and I did not expect less from you. Uh, we already have quite a few questions, interesting questions coming in, I must say. Um, but before we, we move into the Q&A, I would like to give the floor to Michael Reiter, who has been, I mean, after all this historical background, very rich one, I think that there is a, a need to also see a little bit of the, 
uh, of the practitioner's view of, uh, you know, what are the practical implications also of, of this rapprochement. Mikael, um, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, also thank you, Yuichi, for your comprehensive uh, view. Um, and unfortunately, or fortunately, I, I, I was part of, of uh, all your decades, which you have um, uh, put down. And I was even part of decade zero, because my first posting in Japan was 85 to, to 88, which was peculiarly interesting, because at that time, uh, Japan was probably the situation China is today. Um, there was a lot of concern. Japan number one overtaking the United States, smashing of transistor radios in front of the capital. Um, uh, Japan buying uh, buy, buying uh, 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 Hollywood basically. Um, uh, so that that was a, a completely a different different situation, and. Um, at the time, there was little interest uh, from the Japanese side in Europe. Um, I was still working for Austria at the time, uh, and I experienced Europe was an interesting industrial graveyard, but not more. Um, that changed then in 1992, when the concept of the single market uh, came to the European, was in, implemented in the European Union, and that brought an interest of Japan in the in in in, in Europe. Um, I, I would also say that uh, uh, in in your decade, um, uh, I think it was number number two, um, where I was in Japan again. Um, I think there were many efforts on the side of the European Union to engage with Japan, and it was not easy, I must say, to do that. Uh, in, because we were following up at the, at, at the time with um, uh, an action plan, EU Japan action plan. Uh, in 2005, um, I organized uh, to, with um, my, my Japanese colleague the EU Japan People to People Year. In 2003, uh, Japan was designated a strategic partner. In, um, so I think there were a, a lot of overtures uh, to, uh, to Japan. Um, but still, and I was writing that in several articles, I always had the impression there's a situation of benign neglect. Um, and I think uh, that was probably also to, due to the expectation uh, deficit um, uh, at, at, at the time. Uh, in the economic field, and we had to talk a lot in the 1980s and then 20s, it was all about market access. So the relationship between the European Union and Japan was heavily influenced by economics and globalization in terms of economics, and it was not influenced and based on a political partnership, a strategic partnership, a security partnership. That came later. And I think that was uh, the shortcoming uh, of, of, of uh, uh, the time until um, 2011, 12, when there was a change. Because the European Union, uh, building on its uh, engagement, which you have mentioned, uh, the 1994 um, um, New Asia strategy, setting up ASEM, uh, uh, built on, on, on it and added the security dimension. Um, and that, that was new, that the European Union uh, designed um, security policy towards Asia, which included also dealing with the South China Sea. That, um, uh, and uh, that brought, I think, Europe and, 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 uh, and, and Japan closer together politically. Economically, there was a very good relationship, but it was a competitive relationship. Uh, um, so when we came over these market access uh, problems and had a more comprehensive relationship, uh, I think we added to, to, to our relationship. And we have seen that recently uh, with, with the two major um, uh, agreements which were concluded uh, in, in, in terms of trade and the strategic partnership on which we were working for, 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 for quite uh, some time. Now, Japan and 
the European Union are trying to overcome uh, this label of economic giants and political dwarfs. It's a little bit easier to overcome it because the economic giant is also shrinking. Uh, so, so we have to make a, so we have to make an effort uh, not, not to be dwarfs two time economics and and political. And I think this has 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 added uh, to the conviction that we have to, we have to work work uh, uh, together. Um, the important uh, step I think which was which, which was taken then was also linking now up with connectivity. So building up building on 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 the two major. Um, uh, agreements and concluding the first connectivity partnership uh, of the European Union with Japan, which is, I think, the ideal opening for the for the for the Indo-Pacific. Um, I think also the cooperation between Japan and, and the European Union uh, is important in uh, the overall political context which we are seeing, because when we look, how is China? and the US looking at each other, but actually in a very similar way. Um, it is the great power competition and a little bit, and that's the resemblance to the Cold War situation. Everybody is trying to get the, uh, some partners into their camp. And um, uh, we see a clear tendency in Asia, but also with, with Japan, um, not to be just taken for granted. And we have seen with the more active foreign policy, uh, Pre Prime Minister Abe uh, started when he, during, especially during his, his second term, that Japan did not want to have what was also called the karaoke diplomacy, but it wanted to have its own standing. It, um, and I think that was quite a considerable change because not only the prime minister was traveling, but surprise, surprise, even the, the, the minister of foreign affairs started to travel. Uh, and because I remembered in my time in, in, in Japan, how often I got the reply from Gaimusha when, when foreign visitors was coming, oh, the foreign minister is in the diet. Yes, that's important. But as a foreign minister, um, you have to make these, these steps outside. And I think this, this, this has changed. Um, and also uh, the Japan and the European Union have somehow stepped in in this void which the lack of US leadership has, has created. There was no talk about multi multilateralism and cooperation in the, during the Trump administration. And Japan also stepped in to save the TPP, which was a very considerable foreign policy uh, by uh, by Japan in a situation where the US has moved out. That was new. And I think that added also credibility uh, to, to Japan that it wants to have its own course. And I think we are seeing that not only with Japan, we are seeing that also with ASEAN. ASEAN wants to maintain its ASEAN centrality and is looking to Japan, is looking to the European Union in order to maintain that position. And I think that's an area where I would see ample possibility of cooperation between the European Union and, 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 and Japan uh, to shape uh, the regional um, um, uh, system, which is still built around the um, ASEAN centrality, I think, which we, which we promote. And we have to resist all, all, all these uh, efforts to reduce uh, our view to a zero-sum game. So this, this bipolar, Sino-centered or containment of China view is not the view of the European Union and is also not the view of, of Japan. So there I see a, a lot of, 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 of possibilities. Um, I think it's, it, it's also uh, important to, to resist uh, pan-Asian uh, uh, attempts. Uh, you have mentioned some of them, uh, but but uh, this is a, an infectious disease because uh, in, in 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 times of the financial crisis it was Japan which which proposed an Asian IMF which was shot down very quickly. So I think uh, one 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 has to see uh, that we come up with constructive ideas in order how to how to see how to organize also the the the, the regional. 
uh, system. Uh, Japan has taken there another uh, initiative in, in, in uh, reviving Quad, so Quad point uh, two, I would, uh, I would call it. Um, but useful not to forget the origins of it. It was in the Quad one was a tsunami. Um, um, a cooperation effort, and now uh, one one has to see that the Quad uh, is is playing a role. Yes, but I think it cannot be the directorate uh, for the for the for the Indo-Pacific uh, concepts uh, which different uh, different countries uh, uh, have. So, from that point of view, uh, uh, pandemic you have mentioned. Uh, we, sh we should also not forget the importance of, of cooperation um, uh, in uh, climate, climate change. And there, I just would like to, to complement what you were saying. The, the European Union uh, has come up with this, uh, with this uh, China, China um, uh, paper, uh, but it was not only about the systemic rival, uh, but also a uh, partner and competitor. And I think in, the, in, the, in this, this, uh, this trilogue, I think is 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 quite quite useful, and I think the European Union has has shown that also recently, we all need the cooperation of China if we want to uh, fix the, the climate um, uh, problem. Uh, there, this is global, and we have to keep lines of communication and cooperation open in the in in the area of 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 of, of economics. Competition is competition is on. Um, but also to some extent, uh, cooperation. Uh, so the European Union uh, signed this investment agreement with China, but as it was a rival, a uh, systemic rival, um, uh, sanctions were uh, introduced against China because of human rights um, uh, um, uh, violations. So I think there you can see very well how these three levels uh, are, are playing together, but it's not easy uh, to have a coherent policy based on these uh, three uh, uh, levels. So what I would uh, uh, just uh, well, like to finish, I think what 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 Japan and um, the European Union have learned over these uh, three decades or four decades is that economics only is not enough, and especially now in times of of, of geopolitical and, and geoeconomics, uh, I think we have to 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 switch um, uh, to uh, change uh, the cooperation. Uh, I think we are on a good uh, track uh, with these agreements recently uh, concluded, um, but especially when it comes to the strategic partnership and also to the connectivity partnership, I think we have to make sure that we, we add substance as quickly as possible. Uh, uh, it's it's not good to have just something on paper, uh, but, but, but we need uh, to, to implement and uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, which the European Union has started now and which will, it will finish by, by, by September of this year, there are many signs of engagement, I think, which add uh, to the uh, bilateral one. Uh, we should also make efforts uh, to, to make uh, sure that there is a good coordination between the European Union and Japan in order to, to develop the political and security edge, uh, which we all need, and which we need also in this uh, power uh, competition, uh, repeated to avoid that we that we fall into the zero sum uh, bipolar uh, trap, uh, which neither Japan nor the European Union would like to see. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, extremely uh, instructive, as, as, as usual. We have quite a few questions, actually, from the audience, so I will move uh, straight to there. Um, I'll start with uh, first two, but please do not hesitate uh, to, to have more. You can also upvote uh, some of the existing questions to move them up in the, in the, in the priority list. But I'll start with uh, Mike Verbruggen's uh, question. Mike is one of our uh, researchers and very familiar with, with Japan. 
Um, and her question is on the relationship and uh, the dynamics between uh, Japan and the individual European member states. And it's true that also you, know, you could notice um, as, a, as an observer of EU-Japan relations that for the longest time, Tokyo was always preferring to, to speak directly to, to London, to Paris, to Berlin, uh, then to Brussels. Now, uh, what uh, really, what's the interaction? How does this uh, relationship with individual member states drives the interaction with the EU as a whole? And in a sense, what does the EU as such add uh, to the overall uh, relationship? We could see just uh, by the last uh, foreign minister Motegi's visit to Eastern European countries last week, for instance, you know, is, is, is again focused very much targeting individual member states. So, a little bit on this dynamic would be uh, interesting to hear probably from both of you, because uh, also to Michael as a, as a first national diplomat and then an EU diplomat, I can imagine uh, that you have witnessed some of this perhaps frustration uh, that our colleagues in Brussels may have felt for, uh, for some time. And a second question from Max Dundon, one of our regular students. Um, again, a very interesting one. Um, if uh, Japan's um, foreign policy has been normative one, as, as uh, Jose Azense mentioned. And if that's what drives the EU-Japan uh, relationship to a large extent, how come uh, the Japanese are still reluctant to join uh, the G7 in sanctioning China over developments in Xinjiang? Um, and uh, shouldn't Japan actually be more involved in this kind of normative policy in that sense? Uh, again, a very good one. I think uh, Japan's uh, kind of support for human rights uh, in the region is, is again, a, a very interesting uh, angle to, to perhaps uh, say a few words about. I'll, both questions, I think, are, are very good on themselves. So I'll stop there and um, take the two more uh, in, in a bit. Well, thank you very much, Eva, and uh, also thank you very much for two great questions, which Eva mentioned. And also, I'm uh, very glad to have uh, Mihara's variable comments as an insider. Uh, maybe the three decades of EU-Japan cooperation exactly corresponds to the er er era uh, where, where when you serve to the European Union and or your, also your own government. So uh, you have many good memories, but memories about the negotiations and the policy making, I would guess. And uh, coming back to the two questions from the four, I think the, the, the both are great. And uh, I, I should have mentioned that uh, Japan actually did not really enjoy the change of government by elections for many years. Uh, it means that we did not really have liberal ideologically liberal governments. Basically, we have had right-wing conservative LDP governments, and they focus on the interstate relations rather than Japan's relationship cooperation with the European Union. And their uh, 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 foreign policy is basically quite realist, looking at the importance of power politics and the military power. So this is basically uh, 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 relating to uh, Japan's uh, quite uh, a negative or backward looking and sometimes quite reluctant attitude toward the European integration, which perhaps uh, Mihail a little bit uh, implied in his uh, diplomatic more or less comments, perhaps. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, so uh, it means that the Japanese government in the last three, four decades did not fully understand the importance of Europe integration, importance of Brussels. And by looking at more, uh, by focusing more on national governments, as you implied, in, in London, Paris, and Berlin, particularly uh, Japanese government rely on its closer relationship with the UK. So it means that many Japan's important diplomats are based in London. They are reading British newspapers. By reading British newspapers, they think that European integration is really problematic. So this is a, a, a quite bad spiral uh, in Japanese relationship with the European Union. And uh, 
in addition to these, uh, it relates to the second question uh, 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 by Mr. Max Dundon. In, in 1980s, it is interesting to recall that South Africa's biggest trading partner was Japan. Japan had a very strong trade relationship with South Africa because Japan didn't fully accommodate it with economic sanctions towards uh, South Africa because at the time, I would say, human rights issues were not central to Japanese foreign policy. And in, in 1989 as well, soon after the Tiananmen Square massacre incident, Japan was the only country within the G7 summit meeting who, which was strongly against economic sanction towards China. So it means that economic benefits uh, were much more important in Japanese foreign policy than human rights issues or normative issues. So this signifies the recent Japan's body-oriented diplomacy. At last, I would say, Japanese government fully understands the importance of thinking about considering human rights or normative issues. But still, among the current G7 member states, Japan still is the only country which did not sanction China on human rights violation in Xinjiang. So the basic stance remains the same, even though in many respects, other respects, Japan focusing on the importance of uh, normative, uh, normative uh, foreign policy, much more normative foreign policy. So Japan has developed from the previous position to the current position, but still there exists a long and winding road to be equal to the European Union in, respect, in respecting important human rights issues. But on the other hand, I also like to add uh, as a my final remark to the question that uh, Japan's approach to Asian countries uh, in many ways is in many ways much more effective than American or European approach. Japan is most respected country in the ASEAN uh, states, according to many, many different public opinions. So Japanese approach is softer. Japan really understands the difficulty in Asian country in enhancing their own human rights or rule of law, or democracy, and so on. In that sense, Japan is together with these Asian countries to try to help them. So capacity building is one of the important uh, pillar of Japan's free and open in the Pacific strategy. Japan is enhancing rule of law, democracy, and human rights in these countries as well. It takes time. We have to wait, but uh, at the same time, we shouldn't neglect, ignore important norms. But in 1980s, in many ways, I like to say that Japan neglected this aspect. In that sense, uh, it would be reasonable for the European Union that Japan could not perhaps be a reliable partner in these areas. But nowadays, I think that at last, the European Union is recognizing the importance of Japan as normative partner, fully respect the importance of the, these norms, human rights and so on. So Japan is changing, but it takes time and previously Japan's position is a little bit far away from the European Union's position, but I don't know whether which approach, European Union's approach or Japanese approach, which approach was better or is better. So this is my take. Thank you very much, Yuichi. Um, Mikael, would you like to add quickly something uh, to these uh, two questions or shall I move? Yes, on? yes, for uh, pleasure. <laughs> to the, um, <clears throat> I mean, Jim, uh, I think one, 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 the, uh, how Japan treats member states of the European Union and the European Union, I think that one has to look also in this um, uh, two, two periods, which I have tried to 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 to, to paint, uh, during the time where economic issues were, were were important, there was a very strong tendency to go bilateral, to go directly to the to the member states in order to have market access and and and, and these kind of issues. There, it was. Not an easy task, and 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 which is, is right. I don't know how often I had I had to explain uh, people in Meti or in 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 Gamusha why they should talk to the European Union and not to member states because it was a trade policy uh, issue. 
So that was an educational uh, uh, process, which sometimes is still still on ongoing. And uh, I, I, I subscribe uh, to to the problem that uh, too many too, that the information is filtered through the anglophone uh, press. And I could only invite the uh, Japanese newspapers to have as many correspondents in, 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 in Europe to get, uh, to get their own view. I think that would be extremely, uh, extremely uh, helpful. From the political point of view, then Japan has always shown interest in those countries which had a, uh, a seat in the United Nations Security Council, whether permanent or temporary. They always got, 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 got a lot of attention. But now I think we 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 also see a, a change uh, that in the uh, in this more active attitude of both partners, Japan and and anti European Union, uh, the political interest has has increased. The Foreign Minister Motegi uh, was a virtual uh, visitor at the Foreign Affairs Council of 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 the, of the European uh, Union. Um, and and uh, his uh, pre predecessor, I think, uh, Foreign Minister Kono, the, the younger, um, uh, I think he, he, he was very open and very interested in, in incorporating also politically with, with the e European uh, Union. And as the major foreign policy issues are of a global nature, and we have discussed them briefly from, from cybersecurity to, 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 uh, to climate change, the need for cooperation, and if the European Union has a, a united position, and I think it's especially in these areas, then it is a major factor uh, to achieve uh, results to, and, and to set standards. And standard setting is one of the strengths of the European Union. We call it the Brussels effect, uh, and that goes uh, in, in different areas. And I think that is understood by, by, by Japan and will be a solid basis for further uh, uh, cooperation. Now, uh, the normative uh, question is, 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 of course, a good one. It's very difficult to, to, to reconcile um, um, normative uh, principles with realpolitik. I think we, 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 all, we all experience that and Japan experiences it too. Uh, Japan, Japan has, has joined reluctantly, but with uh, sanctions on Russia on the Crimean uh, annexation. Um, it has not yet uh, joined uh, uh, China. I'm not sure what, uh, what uh, Japan is doing on Myanmar. Uh, question mark, um, 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 which I would like to, to, to hear perhaps perhaps more. Uh, so not not easy. Um, and I think, but this is also one of the advantages of uh, cooperation between Japan and the European Union. Um, it is perhaps sometimes easier for the European Union to be principled as an institution. And we see that also with member states, which sometimes are hiding behind the European Union. And I think supporting EU positions could be sometimes an easy way out of Japan and maintaining the principled position. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I think the, the British press is a curse for, uh, for, for Brussels. We had the same discussion with our Indian colleagues for the longest time. Uh, for obvious reasons. Um, many more questions to come, uh, and I'll try to group one uh, batch that concerns the, the form. Uh, Celine, Celine Pajon, my partner in crime in the Japan program. Um, the quad, how does the Japanese and, 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 and Yuichi himself uh, view the um, possibilities or, or the benefits of Europe somehow joining or associating itself with the Quad. Um, what could be the merits of GeoPins teaming up with the Quad uh, as opposed to the different uh, separate cooperation uh, agreements that it can have with the individual members? Uh, and of course, uh, Japan. And this is something that we've been dealing with a lot, you know, the sort of minilateral engagement uh, versus the quad, you know, whether we should even be looking for a name or, or, or institutionalizing this cooperation at all. Um, a related, or perhaps related question, uh, EU-Japan um, strategic partnership agreement and in a different uh, section, the EU-Japan uh, sustainable connectivity uh, engagement. 
where do you see, uh, so it's two separate questions, but I, I group them together. Uh, where do you see them going? Uh, is the sustainable connectivity partnership, um, uh, can, can it really be effective in countering the Belt and Road Initiative in Southeast Asia, Africa, and Eastern Europe? And on the EU-Japan Security Corporation, again, uh, is it somehow wise for the EU to get involved in uh, security in the Asia Pacific and is it feasible? Uh, so that's three questions. I think they're uh, again quite uh, quite broad and, and interesting on themselves. So I'll, I'll stop there and um, pass you the floor. To you. Uh, well, thank you also as well for these great questions, additional great questions. I think these questions are nowadays central, the cent at the central Japanese foreign policy uh, consideration because uh, in the summit meeting be between Suga and Biden in April last month, one of the most important result I would say is that Japan and the United States uh, started to enhance or started to create core partnership. Core partnership is uh, 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 between uh, resilience, uh, we need to have a resilience in our own supply chain because China is sometimes trying to destroy it or sanctioning it. So we need to have much stronger resilient uh, 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 supply chain. But at the same time, not just that, uh, Japan and the uh, United States need to uh, uh, reorganize a kind of a global supply chain, uh, because uh, by uh, focusing more on cutting edge technologies, United States is now uh, realizing that it has a huge disadvantage in cutting edge technologies, uh, semiconductors and so on. So that's why it's important to include both Japan and Taiwan within its orbit, within the sports sphere. So uh, that's why these a tech alliance kind of cooperation, technology alliance kind of cooperation between Japan and the United States must be located at the core of the next decade of the US-Japan alliance. And this is also at the core of Quad. Quad is not simply security cooperation we, because uh, you, Japan and Australia are American allies, but uh, India is not. So it's very difficult to do more than just joint exercises among the four parts. So it's not uh, a, 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 an alliance. It doesn't have a clear reality in it. But on the other hand, it has a strong stance of cooperation. That's why the document is called as a spirit of Quad. So we need spirit to collaborate more deeply among the four countries, particularly on supply chain issues. But one of the biggest question now we face is that now Chinese government is willing to destroy it. And Chinese government is now pro trying to provide vaccines, Sinovac vaccine to India. As you know, India is in a terrible situation. It needs a vaccination. But on the other hand, the United States, Australia, Japan cannot provide sufficient amount of vaccination to the Indian population. Instead, China is willing to do this. I do not know whether the Indian government, Modi government, will accept it or not. Of course, the clear aim of Chinese government is trying to divide and rule, destroy the spirit of Quad. Because do, do, in, in the document of the spirit of Quad, it is written that the four countries began to collaborate in vaccination to supply a sufficient amount of vaccines. So in this sense, I will stop here. It's really core at the current situation further, uh, Japan can uh, promote and advance the reorganization of supply chain in Asia with the United States, with other countries, or not. And the European Union must decide which kind of supply chain uh, the EU is willing to create or willing to join in. Thank you, Uchi. Mikael, would you like to add something on these questions? Well, on, on, on Quad, um, I mean, quad or quad plus, whatever, whatever is is discussed. I think I, I think quad is not an institution. It's not an organization. It's it's a meeting forum, 
Um, and I, I would not uh, upstage it. Uh, it cannot become a directorate uh, to control or to direct what's going on in the Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, I think that would be uh, going down the wrong uh, path. It would also contradict uh, uh, the commitment of the European Union and Japan uh, to ASEAN and ASEAN centrality, because this is clearly not ASEAN centrality. So it can be one of the of, of the uh, many lateral forums which could have a sort of of, of uh, um, function uh, to initiate uh, um, open open functional cooperation in that areas which which have been been singled out. Uh, but um, uh, I would not like to see uh, Quad uh, to become a sort of of a dominating uh, uh, directorate. Um, uh, which would be too small at the, at, at the directorate. And as a multilateralist, I don't like directorates uh, to, to, uh, to begin with. So I have uh, strong reservations there. And, and it re reminds me also a little bit of the East Asia Summit, uh, which was upstaged as long as President Obama was there. Then uh, with, uh, with, with his successor, it seemed to have, have disappeared uh, we will see what it is doing but this is more in the in the, in the asean centrality um, uh, uh, line and i would not jump on every train which is leaving the station because uh, first check where the train is going and then jump on the uh, then jump on the train so, and and the eu and, and 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 japan could have a very good osmosis in exchanging information what is what what is going uh, on but uh, i think uh, i would not argue for more uh, than 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 that. Um, I think the uh, to the second question, um, the European Union has no other option than to engage in security in 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 Asia. Security has become indivisible. And I cannot say they are far away. It's another continent, which is wrong, by the way, because we are all sitting on the Eurasian continent. Um, um, and we have so many global challenges, which we have uh, uh, mentioned from, from, from cybersecurity. Uh, while we talk what's going on in the United States, um, uh, it's, 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 about, uh, it's about the, the um, uh, uh, climate, climate change. It will be about the pandemic. Uh, uh, so this is all security. Uh, one should not have a narrow view that security is 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 counting missiles and 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 aircraft carriers, which is an important part, but not the only part. So I think European Europe, not only the European Union, Europe uh, has an interest in security in Asia and vice versa, because also, of course, Asia is looking what is what is going on uh, on, on the European continent, what's going on in the Balkans, how, how is Europe dealing with, with North Africa, what is the relationship of, of, of Europe with, with Russia. So this is all of particular importance and the good old times, which have never been good old times, they, where you can neatly separate things, that's gone. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Michael. Well, uh, our time is running up. Uh, so uh, there are three last questions. Of course, you have access to them. You can see them uh, for yourself. Um, basically, what, uh, how do historical relations and, and the kind of individual member states colonial legacies it affect European and interests, uh, European and Japanese interests and views in the region? Does it does it have an impact? Uh, well, it impacts some somehow the European diplomatic presence and trade relations somehow. Um, it, what would be uh, the direction of the uh, Suga administration uh, in terms of EU Japan uh, relations? Is it uh, is he likely to continue um, the direction taken by Prime Minister Abe, or, or what can we expect is a second question. And finally, uh, one on the eventuality of uh, further cooperation between uh, Japan and China. Uh, now, of course, uh, we, we don't have time to all uh, for, for all three of them, so please pick any, uh, or use this time also to uh, you know, share some of your final thoughts, perhaps, um in, in very very briefly uh jose sensei your last two minutes 
No, I am very much impressed by good questions. So many good questions. So that's why I'm pity that I cannot fully respond to all these questions. But uh, let me wrap up in a, in a, in an integrated way. First of all, uh, Suga administration will continue to show the similar kind of approach which Abe administration shows because uh, Suga uh, had been at the center of Prime Minister's office for seven years and eight months during the Shinzo Abe's administration. So the basic line remained the same. The biggest difference is that the Abe's foreign policy is top-down style, while uh, Suga's style is bottom-up. So Mr. Foreign Affairs is now controlling foreign policy making. This is the biggest difference. And also, when we think about China, Japan, China relations, of course, the history matters. Uh, because of that, Japanese government couldn't fully focus on the importance of norms because Japan would be criticized on these issues by surrounding countries, Korea and China. But now Japan is much more vocal on this point. But uh, still, it is difficult that in Japan, we have uh, historical memories. That's why this actually restrained the activity of Japanese foreign policy. So Japan must continue to be quite careful in choosing important options in our foreign policy. Thank you very much. Sorry, final thoughts? Well, thank you. Uh, well, on, just on the, <laughs> on the colonial issue, uh, I think this is another advantage of the European Union because you can you can uh, accuse the European Union of many things, but not of a colonial past, and that's also one of the issues which is sometimes uh, a, a good um, uh, uh, environment for member states. But what when it comes to the past, my hope and wish would be that the in that case the European example. Uh, could help overcome some of the legacies in Asia, which we are still facing. And from my personal experience, I always come back to the relationship between Korea and Japan, which I would like to see improved for the sake of, 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 of security, uh, alliance uh, work. And, and I think this is something, and, and many of the issues which we have discussed um, need cooperation globally, but also in the, in, in the region. So I think that would be um, one, one, one of my uh, uh, wishes. And I will just end with, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, one, one sentence which, which I, I, I have written in an article which is just, just about uh, to, 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 to be published. For decades, the EU and Japan had pursued a similarly cautious line towards foreign policy albeit for different reasons, but it has taken the return of geopolitics and geoeconomics, the essence of China, and the retreat of the US from multilateralism to push these two strategic partners closer together. And I think it should remain that way, even if the United States has rediscovered that there is multilateralism and everything associated with it. So thank you very much, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much, Michael. I presume that's uh, from your chapter uh, of, of a book that uh, has just uh, appeared. Uh, shame that we cannot see the physical copy yet, but we're exciting to excited to, to hear it. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, Jose Asensei, uh, Professor Reiter, for joining us uh, today. Of course, the story of uh, EU-Japan relations uh, is, is far from over. It, uh, most of it actually remains to be written, and we will continue uh, following it and, and discussing it and, and, and sharing our insights with, uh, with uh, the European and, and Asian audience. Um, actually, there is, a, there is a policy brief that uh, me and Celine uh, uh, have written and that should be published uh, this week on the topic as well. So stay tuned. Uh, stay tuned also for more uh, of our public lectures. Only next week we will be discussing Japan's engagement in and with NATO. So here we're broadening up, but we're staying somehow related to uh, EU, to Japan, Europe relations. Uh, with Professor Michito Tsuroka and our discussion from NATO. So stay tuned, do not forget to register uh, and uh, take care. I'll see you very soon, goodbye. Well, thank you very much, bye. Thank you.